My name is Sarah Gladue. I'm the Director of Education and Citizen Science for Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust, and I welcome all of you to the program today. Uh, we're going to be learning about vernal pools and tools to conserve them with Dr. Aram Calhoun, and I'm very, very grateful that she was able to um, have time to, to uh, work with us and talk with us and share all that she's been working on. So it's very exciting. She's um, with the Department of Fisheries and Biology at the um, University of Maine, and she focuses on the interface between um, science and policy. So this is really a good, a good type of program for us to get involved with since we, um, all of us, I think, um, are involved in some fashion in science and policy uh, regarding our own properties or our municipalities or whatever's going on in, in our in conservation in, in our communities. So um, Aram, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. And um, I'll just a, a couple of housekeeping uh, details. Uh, I am recording this and so I will send you a link um, when this is over. Um, it might take 24 hours or so, but we'll send you a link and then you can uh, see the program or you can share it with somebody who didn't get a chance to see it. Um, we, in a few minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, actually I'll do it right now. I'm going to mute everybody and then I will unmute our speaker so that she can speak. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that way we won't have any, any uh, conflicting noise or anything like that while, while she's speaking. But um, at the end, if, um, I'll, I'll make it possible for folks to, to unmute themselves and then be able to converse and ask questions and so forth. In the meantime, if folks would put their questions or comments in the chat, we can also work through those at the end of the program with her and um, probably answer a lot of questions that way as well. Um, so I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our our wonderful speaker this evening. So thank you again, Dr. Calhoun for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm sad that I can't see your faces. I still haven't gotten used to talking to a computer screen. Um, but I saw from the chat box what some of your interests are in coming to this program. I just wanna make one clarification for my department. It's at University of Maine and it's um, wildlife fisheries and conservation biology. Just, just to be clear what the department is, yeah. And so what we're going to cover tonight, I know a lot of you are just are interested in ecology. So what I would like to discuss tonight is an overview of ecology and more specifically the research that we've done to inform policy. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background in case you don't know what a vernal pool is, we'll cover that, but I won't be going in depth into ecology. I really wanna give you the background for how we moved forward into coming up with what we think is a very creative and possibly more effective vernal pool conservation tool that is completely relevant to municipalities, land trusts and local landowners. So I hope you find it of interest. I'm um, trying to advance. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So many of you are familiar with vernal pools and probably realize that there's no one vegetation type that makes a vernal pool. They can be dominated by her herbaceous vegetation or simply pools or even by trees. Basically the defining characteristic of a vernal pool is that it fills in the spring as you've just witnessed from snow melt um, and it generally dries down by the end of the summer. And these are very important conditions for the vernal pool. So they, they have no permanent inlets and outlets. So you see this little tributary dries up completely and that allows a fishless condition. And this fishless condition is important because it prevents the breeding permanent populations of fish which love to eat the amphibians that breed in vernal pools and it prevents permanent populations of green frogs and bullfrogs that need permanent ponds in order to reproduce. Bullfrog and green frog tadpoles also love to eat the vernal pool species. So this is one of the most important conditions. So in summary, a vernal pool is, is ephemeral although it may 
only dry down partially. It may have hold water um, for the whole year, but it's greatly drawn down. They are generally small, and this is relevant because I put the 4,300 square feet there because that is the limit for being able to fill a wetland without any permit anywhere. So up to 70% of the pools that I surveyed over the 25 years I've been working on them have been less than 4,300 square feet. So it's an at-risk small resource. And we've already gone over the inlet and outlet and the importance of no breeding fish, green frogs or bullfrogs because it's a very specialized breeding habitat. And I'm going to share with you the animals that depend on them in Maine. So there's the fairy shrimp, which is a very charismatic crustacean. It can be up to an inch in length and its entire life cycle is only six weeks. It's, um, they're like bulbs, winter bulbs. They need to dry down and freeze to get hardened off and then they can bloom in the spring. This is the freshwater analog of sea monkeys. Many of you probably know about brine shrimp. So it's just the freshwater analog. The wood frog, which is the most northerly ranging frog in the United States, is one of the main characters and it's got a mask on it. So it helps you tell it from everybody else. Um, the spotted salamander, which some people call the yellow spotted, but it's really just spotted. Um, the blue spotted complex, I'm not going to get into their genetics, but there's a, a whole suite of blue spotted animals that are hybrids with some other animals and some are pure. So those are the players in vernal pools and, and they're specialized for breeding in vernal pool habitats. I had the fun this spring uh, with the pandemic of being able to go out regularly to check on vernal pools. So this is a vernal pool near my house and I was able to follow it um, through the winter into the spring big night. So this is how things start out. We get the, we didn't get enough snow, but we got some snow and the vernal pool species are underground hibernating during this period. And they know when it's time to come out because they literally thaw out by warm spring rain. So this frogsicle is a wood frog that has frozen 65 to 70% of its body with, a, with an internal glycogen or antifreeze to prevent it from harming its cells. So this animal literally thaws out and then starts to move towards the pools. And that's why we depend on these warm spring rains. The salamanders are underground in shrew burrows and they are woken up. They're not frozen solid, but they're woken up by the warm rain coming through their burrows and telling them it's time to start moving to breeding pools. So you, you will see them moving through the snow and we, we call this, and I see in the chat that some of you have participated in Big Night. Um, it doesn't happen every night, but it's the first really warm spring, wet, rainy evening when a large number of wood frogs and salamanders make their way to their breeding pools. Often they arrive at the breeding pools when there's still ice on the pools. And as you can see here, the spotted salamander courtship is happening under the ice. The wood frog, it looks like an innocent, lovely creature right here, really beautiful in this pool. But if you've witnessed a breeding event of wood frogs, you never want to come back as a wood frog female, which I'll show you in a minute. If you're weak of stomach, you might not want to watch this. Um, but the wood frogs live a much shorter time than the salamanders. The salamanders actually have time for a lovely courtship because they've got 20 years to breed. And so they have time to bring out the wine and be pleasant and do dances. But the wood frogs and a wood frog adult may only have one or two chances to breed. So they're pretty desperate to be the one who gets to the female. So the little salmon colored female is being jumped on by all these males. There's many occasions when she drowns, but this isn't, this isn't really a fun activity for her. Um, we call these guys explosive breeders because they tend to all come to the pool at the same time to breed. And I think that's part of the fact that they have a shorter lifespan. So my students and I have studied 
vernal pools in the pool itself for a number of years and we felt like we had enough information on the ecology within the pool. Um, this, this person, Dawn Morgan, you can see wood frog egg masses in the upper right all around the shrubs, but she wanted to determine whether they also lay egg masses on the floor of the vernal pool and they, they do. So anytime we do egg mass counts, we know we're undercounting because they're also on the pool floor where we don't see them. So my lab started looking at what happens outside of the pool. And one of the questions is where do the adults go and come from when they come to the breeding pools? Where do they overwinter? So we've learned that wood frogs and spotted salamanders overwinter in upland forests. Then the question was, where do they go after they leave the vernal pool? And it turns out that wood frogs and blue spotted salamanders tend to go to more wet areas for the summer. And then everybody moves to the upland forest during the winter. And then we were wondering about juveniles and we know that the juveniles are the ones that strike out to reach new pools and are responsible for keeping genetic diversity alive by mixing up gene pools. So only about 5% of the juveniles will go outside of their, their pool shed and seek out new vernal pools. So there's a lot of emigration and migration going on and these animals are using non-pool habitat more than 95% of their life cycle, which means that having a focus just on regulating the vernal pool itself is not going to capture all the life history needs of these animals. So back to my pool, this was um, the same pool a little bit later in the spring and it's already beginning to dry down. And we have to ask ourselves, so where are these animals going? Once they leave the pool, they've all gone in and bred and now they're taking off and dispersing into our forests. So the way we got at that was to put little radio transmitters in waistbands on the wood frogs and follow them around the landscape. In our current focus is on what do these animals do in developing landscapes? What do they do in suburbia? So we follow every single color line you see there is a different frog and every dot is when we got um, a reading, actually located the frog and saw where they were, wrote down what habitat they were in. So one of the ways that we can help to develop management strategies for people is to learn what the post-breeding habitat needs are of each of the species. That is, where do they go once they leave their pool and how do they get safely to where they're going? So, I'll give you the results of that in a minute. Um, we also followed frogs in the fall to their hibernation sites. And the wood frog uh, just makes a little shallow depression in the leaf litter. You can see the wood frog is right above the coin there. And they're under the snow for the winter until it melts and they are called to the pools. So we put an exclosure, this, on the frog, exclosure around where it hibernated so that we can relocate it and put a radio transmitter on it in the spring and follow it to its pool. So what we learned in general, I can't give you all the research results, but here are the big take homes. In suburbia, hedgerows or other areas where there's cover are very important to get through the lawn to adjacent forested habitat. We've learned that mortality events were, came from lawn chemicals, pets, lawn mowers, and sewer drains. Um, we actually had um, a frog in a sewer drain and my graduate student called up the sewer department and said that an animal had been trapped in the sewer drain. Did not tell the person that it was a wood frog because he was afraid he wouldn't come. So they got the grate off and he's got this expensive transmitter on him and the guy is looking down in there and saying, I don't see an animal. My student says, yes, you do, it's the frog. And the, and the guy fortunately thought it was funny, but we do know that they, they fall into sewer drains. Um, we know that hibernating animals may return to the same hibernation sites, just like they return to the same pools to breed. Now this means that these animals are very tied to their landscape. And finally, vernal pools and wetlands in general serve 
of as rest stops for these animals on their migrations to summer and winter habitat. So they depend not just on their vernal pool, but on a landscape with wetland features in it to travel to and from their summer and winter habitats. We also know recorded travel distances for the adults are, are quite large. So the maximum for wood frogs is over 3,000 feet. Um, for blue spotted, it's over 1,000 feet. For spotted, it's over 800 feet. So these animals are traveling a long distance to their other habitats. And we know that the juveniles can travel miles to other breeding pools. So what we've learned is that these animals have complex habitat needs. It's the pool is in the middle there, but you see that some have different ha summer habitat than winter habitat, such as the wood frogs. Um, and if we're going to conserve vernal pools in general, we need to think about the complexity of the landscape and maintaining corridors for animals to get to and from those important habitat elements. So the current regulation for vernal pools in the state of Maine is that the Army Corps of Engineer regulates vernal pools and they have a federal area of concern, that's what they call it, 750 feet around a vernal pool. Now that does not mean that it's a reg it, that it's um, that you can't develop in that zone. It just means that you have to get a permit and go through a review process. But the regulations have changed over the last four years, and now uh, you do not need to get vernal pool permission if you're not impacting any other wetlands on your property. So a lot of the teeth have been taken out of the 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 federal regulation. In the state of Maine, we regulate a subset of vernal pools called significant vernal pools. And we regulate an envelope that's 250 feet around that, that pool. And yes, there are two different sets of regulations for pools. And this is why landowners hate wetland regulations. They're not consistent and you have to get two sets of permits. For significant vernal pools, um, the numbers are 40 wood frog egg masses or more, 20 spotted salamander egg masses or more, or 10 um, blue spot egg masses or more. And that makes a significant vernal pool. And less than 20% of all pools that have been regulated to date meet that criteria. That was a compromise um, based on political needs as well as ecological needs. So it got vernal pools on the radar about being an important natural resource, but it falls far short of conserving them for the long term. And that's where my lab and my colleagues began to be concerned about the long-term viability of vernal pools in Maine. The amphibians have a flagrant disregard for the law and they often go way beyond that 250 foot permitting zone and are not regulated at all in that respect. If you if we review the numbers you'll see that they're far in excess of 250 feet for significant vernal pools. The other issue is that if Sarah has a vernal pool and I have a vernal pool I can develop up to one quarter of my 250 foot zone and she can develop up to a quarter of hers. If I'm trying to determine significance on my pool, I am not allowed to count the egg masses that are on Sarah's half of the pool. So you can see that there's a lot of ecological loopholes. Although I am very glad there are regulations because it at least brings pool management to the table to be discussed. So also I've discovered, I've always loved amphibians. I grew up playing with them. Um, and I was horrified to learn that a lot of people don't even want to touch amphibians because they think they're disgusting, slimy, weird. Um, I had no idea. I think that I'm weird now. That's, that's the conclusion I've come to. They're not an easy sell. So once our lab got enough information about how we can serve pools, we had to figure out, well, how can you sell that to the public that may not care about 
three amphibians and one invertebrate, one little crustacean. So we started thinking about well, what is the greater role of vernal pools in the landscape? And, and we know that they have a, a role in hydrology, in recharging water tables. We know that they're connected, not isolated through aquifers and groundwater and runoff. So they're, they're part of a hydrologic landscape and they help to um, conserve water in rain events by being these little basins in the hillside. Uh, there's been a lot of research that's come out recently showing how pools influence watershed hydrology, contribute nutrients to terrestrial forests and help export carbon to terrestrial forests. So there's a lot of energy that is transported from vernal pools into the greater landscape. And um, I can't see any of you to talk about this, but you'll see this is a list of animals that we have documented in vernal pools. And you'll see that the ones that are in yellow, I would ask you if you were there, what do these signify? Well, they're, they're animals that people like to hunt um, or have some game value and are important to a signature wildlife in Maine. Well, these are all animals that benefit from the bounty of vernal pools. And what you will understand before you leave this talk is that I feel that vernal pools are a very integrated part of our forested landscapes. It's a free flow of energy back and forth. They are not isolated pools that are simply breeding habitat for a very small number of species. So if you look at, as pools are drying down and you look at the density of egg masses here, these are all wood frog egg masses. And just think about the number of animals that could be feeding on these. We, we think of these as fast food oases or dining in. And we had a PhD student who did a lot of camera trapping in vernal pools to document exactly who was visiting and taking advantage of this bounty of carbon, whether they're eating the adults or the eggs. So I'm going to go fairly quickly through some of the most interesting camera trap data um, that she found, because it's fun to see all the species that visit pools. So this year, pools are drying down alarmingly early in my neck of the woods. And I live in Amherst, Maine, just east of Bangor. This is one of my pools that last year at this time I was wading into in chest waders. This is what it looks like now. But this is providing food. And here are some of the species. If you look closely, you'll see a mallard duck flying out of this pool. These are camera traps, so the pictures are not horribly clear. Black bear coming to forage in the pools. In the summertime, these little dots of vernal pools are the moistest place in the forest and they have food left in them. They have developing larvae, metamorph amphibians, plant roots. Um, here's a fawn, a fox, a fisher, this beautiful picture of an owl hunting frogs at night, a bobcat, a great blue heron. And on the right side here, you can see a raccoon foraging. So clearly one of the benefits of vernal pools is this fast food oasis. The second benefit is fast food takeout. So say that you don't feel like going out and visiting a pool. Um, all of these animals, this is, this is a, a pitfall trap that I collected all of these amphibians in one night in one five gallon bucket. So this gives you an idea of the biomass going in. These are spotted salamanders, blue spotted and wood frogs. Well, they provide food for a lot of raptors as they leave the pools, uh, a lot of snakes, like both species. Um, so we, we do have lots of um, evidence from beeping radio transmitters that our animals have been eaten by raptors and other and reptiles. Also, vernal pools are a very important habitat for some of Maine's threatened and endangered or special listed species like the spotted turtle, Blanding's turtles. Um, my husband, Mac Hunter and Mark McCullough and Philip de Maynardier. Now, I don't have three husbands. Those last two are folks we collaborated with with US Fish and Wildlife and Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. 
they were doing a study on conservation of Blanding's turtles and potted turtles in southern Maine. They're not vernal pool species. They weren't going to study vernal pools, but they found a very high correlation between density of vernal pools in the landscape and the presence of these species because they use vernal pools for estivating in the summer, resting and foraging. It's a very big part of their life history. So the more we study and look for connections, the more integrated these pools become in New England forests, really. So now that you see the value of these pools and why it might be difficult to conserve them if we looked at them just in isolation, let's talk about the interaction of amphibians and people and then we'll move to how people can be part of the solution and not just the problem. So one of my concerns is that there are a lot of vernal pools in the landscape and now we know that these creatures are spanning out into the same places that we want to live. So my fear is that we end up fragmenting their landscape so much that they cannot navigate and have vital, vibrant populations with people. Um, we know some of the problems I, I did see in the chat, and thank you for those of you who have participated in Midnight, uh, midnight, midnight Big Night, um, in helping to move these animals across the road. This spotted salamander could be a college student. I mean, they live 15 to 20 years. Just think about all the college students you're running over. Um, roads are a problem, and, and we know that. So human habitation is a problem. The salt that we put on roads affects adults, and it affects growth and fitness in larvae in pools near roads. Um, but there is good news coming. Um, the challenges that we face is that pools are hard to inventory, that you have to conserve a pool plus the forest, and that we're working on private property. In New England, most of the land is in private property. It has no charismatic values. There aren't fuzzy animals animals with big eyes that everybody loves um, in these pools. And a small subset are regulated. So this, to me, seems like a resource at risk. Um, I have relatives who call them muck holes. So guidance, and, and this, is, this is where I get excited. It could be a little depressing working in this field, but the more I work with people, the more hopeful that I get. And I'm going to share that with you. Um, what has not worked by itself, I believe in all levels of regulation, I think they all work well together, but by itself, traditional top-down regulation is not doing it. By itself, voluntary, regulate, voluntary management isn't doing it. So a new approach is to look at locally driven solutions. So sort of stop starting from the bottom up and meeting the top down. Um, and this is going to be based completely on the available science, not on a compromised political definition. And this approach is going to take into account diverse perspectives, not just the perspectives of the ecologist, not just the perspective of the regulators. And we want to compensate rural landowners for their stewardship. And we want to provide an option for management that is predictable and consistent and flexible, not one that varies whether it's a state regulation or a federal regulation where you have to wait and get a pool assessed and you don't know how it's going to come out. We wish to complement the existing policies. So we decided to put together a stakeholder group um, and build off of a, a vernal pool citizen science project that we completed in 2011. Here are all the towns where we proactively mapped vernal pools using trained citizen scientists on private properties where we, we obtained permission. All of these towns have a database of potential and or assessed vernal pools. So we decided to work with the towns that already knew us and we picked two towns to start with or no, because the university is there and it's easy um, to work closely with them, and Topsom, because it was a very progressive town that wished to go a step beyond the maps, which just tend to sit in the town halls and not be used. So we put 
a seven year, we didn't expect it to go seven years, but we put together a diverse stakeholder group and called it turning contention into collaboration. So this stakeholder group, it did take us seven years. We had 25 regular participants over a hundred meetings. And here's what's new. The people that were at the table include economists and developers and planning consultants. And I've worked with all the people that are in black for a whole career, but I had not worked with these people in blue and their perspectives were invaluable. And the only way that we can get a regulation or a management plan that works, if, if everyone has buy-in from the beginning and they co-produce the management plan so that they understand it and it pays attention to everyone's perspectives. And that's why it took so long. If you're interested in the details of the process, we have this paper and you can email me and I'd be happy to send you a copy of it. So the seven years ended up with a document called the Special Area Management Plan. And it's called the Vernal Pool SAMP for short. And this plan is an alternative mitigation tool for impacts to vernal pools. It's approved by both the state and federal levels. It's been formally and officially adopted by Topsum and Orono. And it's available to all New England towns because the Army Corps has incorporated it into their general permit. And I'm not going into the details of this because this part is boring, but we have the collaboration of the feds and the state. The part that will be of interest to you is that at the municipal level, the town passes an ordinance saying that they want partial authority for handling vernal pool development. And the town finds willing landowners to serve as conservation stewards for developer dollars and the developer dollars go straight to a land trust. So it's, it's a community of the town, the land trust and the rural landowners and the developers. That's the way it works. So I'm gonna give you a real thumbnail sketch of how the SAMP works. Um, your town has to have a comprehensive plan. And in the comprehensive plan, you have designated rural and growth areas. The blue dots on this map are all the vernal pools. If you're a developer, you can impact a vernal pool, fill it, put your development right around its edges, do anything that you want. You pay a fee based on market value of your property with and without a vernal pool. The difference of that cost, we take 40% and we send it to a land trust. The land trust then works with a rural landowner to conserve a vernal pool on their property. The whole, if you think back on the science that I have gone through, the whole reason behind this is that a growth area is a growth out area. We will have pools surrounded by development and we will have done mitigation, but we won't have conserved vernal pool values at all. We'll end up being urban wetlands, which are very valuable. And these pools will probably just be urban wetlands, but they will no longer function as a specialized breeding habitat for amphibians because the hydrology will change. The post-breeding habitat isn't there. It's a habitat that, would, that bullfrogs and green frogs can live in, but the vernal pool species species can't. So what have we done? We've taken the money from the developers and we're remunerating the rural landowner for conserving their pools for the town. And this is what it looks like. So rather than having this circle of regulation and permitting around a vernal pool where the animals eventually are going to blink out, we trade that for dollars that will conserve two pools plus 70 acres where we have vital populations. And guess what else? It's not focused on vernal pools. What happens is with the land trust being the stewards of this, they have a grand vision of green spaces and connected landscapes. This provides seed money to, convent, to connect landscapes for all wildlife. And I've already shown you that vernal pools and the forests are supporting a wide range of small and large mammals and birds and other amphibians and reptiles. 
So this is more of, of conserving rural landscapes. So the developer gives money to the land trust, and gives money to the rural landowner. The mitigation dollars do not leave the town. So the community outcomes under this new plan include certainty and predictability, compact development in the growth area because it's really encouraging developers to build out in the growth area. It supports a municipal vision for rural lands so that you have the rural area which has intact landscapes, remuneration for, for rural landowners. It conserves pools and a landscape context and it conserves connectivity. So we end up managing pools at the landscape scale, at the watershed scale, and not pool by pool in isolation. So we have a very good, I think, updated web page. If you're interested in learning more about the special area management plan, because I know that I've gone very rapidly through this and I wanted to leave lots of time for discussion, um, go to our webpage, go to the tab special area management plan, and there you will see a PowerPoint that describes the plan and um, a manual that was written for the landowners and the municipalities describing how this plan works. And we have also been working a lot on outreach. You may have noticed that proud landowners mark whether they're part of what was the small woodlot owners of Maine or here um, the, the um, farmland trust. And we have developed a sign for people who conserve their lands for rural pool wildlife. Um, we're hoping that a lot of rural landowners that have their land in tree growth will consider working with their, their foresters who do management plans for them and consider becoming um, a vernal pool conservation person. And with that, I would love to open it up and hear your questions and happy to answer anything on ecology. I know it was a whirlwind tour, but I left plenty of time so that we could have a dialogue um, and dig deeper into anything that you were more interested in. That's great. Thank you very much. I found that very interesting and a lot of it was new to me. I will um, uh, go ahead. I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna ask everyone Oh, I'm going to allow everyone to unmute if you wish. You don't need to unmute so um, people can speak up if they wish. I'm going to start with um, some of the questions, some of which are, are related to the beginning of your talk um, so that folks can have that information on hand as they're, as they're thinking about the rest of what you presented. Um, Do you want me to stop the share? Sh uh, yeah, that would be great. And we'll send everybody the links anyway. So if, that, that's great. Thank you. And we, I can see people. I can see some people. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, now we look like humans at least. Uh, so um, one of the questions early on was about um, are, are peepers part of the, uh, the community of animals at, in, in vernal pools? That's a, that's a really good question. Hi, BB. You came. <laughs> um, yes, there, it's not a primary breeding site. Peepers often help show us where the vernal pools are, but peepers are much more broad in their um, choice of breeding habitat. They can breed in permanent waters. And in, in Southern New England, they tend to breed more in vernal pools. Our vernal pools in Maine tend to be more forested and darker. Um, we have a shorter, did you notice we have a shorter growing season? <laughs> so the, the more open pools in Southern New England, I found peepers a lot more, but yes, indeed they do, do, do call from vernal pools, although they may not necessarily breed in them, but they can, but they're not right. an indicator species because you, you know that any road you drive down, there are peepers everywhere. <laughs> yes, there are right now. Um, and when was big night this year is another question that was asked. Well, that's an excellent question. And um, I'll tell you that there is no answer for that ever. So the, the hard thing about big night is that it depends, you may not realize this, but the big night ranges from March to May. 
depending on where you live in Maine. We have that much of a biophysical gradient from Southern Maine to Northern Maine that the vernal pool season is a full two months later in Northern Maine. They are just now yeah. thawing out. Um, I'm sitting here in a snowstorm. Um, big night is very variable and I would love to be able to predict it because it makes life hard when you're trying to get volunteers out. But I can tell you that big night generally is when we've had, we have a really good evening rainstorm and the temperatures are in the forties. The species that come out during big night have very different life histories. We tend to call them vernal pool species, but salamanders are very different than wood frogs. And part of it is because I remember I told you that wood frogs live a lot less time, three to five years, maybe two years. They will breed, I've seen them breed even when it's 32 degrees and there is not a drop of precipitation because they are just so focused on getting out there and breeding. Whereas the salamanders who are longer lived can be really fussy and they may even skip a breeding year if the weather conditions aren't proper. So I can't answer the big night question on a night because climatic conditions, rainfall can be patchy, temperature can be patchy, coniferous forests tend to thaw out later than deciduous forests. So you really have to have a special pool that you watch near where you live and wait for it to thaw about two thirds of the way. And then you know that probably the next warm rain, you should go out looking for a big night. Um, so yeah, there's no, no specific answer to that. I wish there were, it would make things much easier. No, but maybe, maybe not, but what you just told us was, was a really good, a good way to, to think about monitoring our, the pools in our own area. So that's very helpful. Um, another question is about what the depth of water is that's necessary for the various amphibians to successfully reproduce. That's a, that's another great question. I think we have a bunch of ecologists on the line. Um, <laughs> that's also very variable. The fairy shrimp take six weeks to fully develop and they, they, you know, prefer not to have the other amphibians there. Their whole life cycle tends to be done before the others get there because guess what? They're delicious little floating things with legs and pretty color. So they can breed in much shallower, much more ephemeral pools than the other animals. Um, wood frogs need more water and longer time than fairy shrimp and the salamanders need even longer periods of time to fully develop. So a pool that is probably that is less than three feet deep um, probably will dry up too early for the amphibians. When I go out in vernal pools looking for things, I'm off, I mean, granted, I'm not a large woman, I'm five feet, but I'm up to the top of my chest waders. So, you know, they can be four to five to six feet deep. Um, if the middle of the pool is less than three feet deep, it depends on whether it's a groundwater fed pool or if it's a perched pool abo above the groundwater, that's just dependent on rainfall. So you're gonna find my answers tell you absolutely nothing, that it's a very complicated ecosystem and that you really need to learn your pools in your area and then you get a better feel for what's gonna work or not. But, but as a rule of thumb, something that's less than three feet deep or two feet deep, I would say might at the very best be a fairy shrimp pool. Great. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, another question is, um, what do the frogs and salamanders eat on their migrations to and from the pools? Ah, great question. This is amazing. So you're a wood frog female. You've carried your, your unfertilized eggs with you all winter you freeze solid, you thaw, you make your way to your pool, which could be a thousand feet, 3000 feet. You go there and you get beaten up by male wood frogs and you don't eat a speck on your way or while you're in the breeding pool. Um, they are using all their energy to get to the pool and nobody's having a snack on the way. On the way out, they will eat anything that they can fit in their mouths. So they, you know, they generally eat invertebrates, um, whatever they can get in the leaf litter. And this is why 
the you know a good quality forest floor is so important for maintaining amphibian populations coarse woody material downed logs um, lots of leaf litter anything that's going to harbor a diverse and tasty invertebrate community that's that's really great that you made that point i i see a lot of um folks at least with the inclination to clear, clean up their forest um, a little bit. And so um, having you say that is, is uh, helpful information for everybody. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just gonna add one little thing that I remembered um, from a graduate student of mine who was studying wood frogs and he started tearing apart um, like he was a bear, um, really degraded large logs. And he found that some of the wood frogs in the summer were refuging, you know, hanging out in in the really punky wood just eating invertebrates I mean you don't know until you look but I'm glad that you highlighted that that relatively natural forest with what we have on forest floor which is a complex floor with downed woody material is very important for all the amphibians great uh, the next one is, is a comment and uh, she says getting some of the beautiful children's picture books that focus on amphibians and vernal pools into classrooms and parents hands may help increase the number of people who find amphibians interesting and attractive. I thought that was a great observation. Yes. Thank you for that comment. Um, Another question about can a vernal pool be improved by deepening or damming removal of certain grasses that grow thickly, et cetera. Is there a technical assistance program to accomplish these changes? Okay, um, another very good question. Vernal pools that naturally occur in our forests are just fine without us. They've been there, been developing for 10,000 years. Um, if th that's the natural pools, okay? Those are natural pools in good forests that are undisturbed. If you have a disturbed pool where the forest canopy has been removed around the pool, there are definitely things that you can do to improve it, like plant trees around it, get shading there again, get leaf litter going in. If it's been a completely open farm pond um, that was once a deepened vernal pool, then there may be remediation there where you put shrubs and trees back around the pool and you take out the cattail but I would highly recommend that natural pools in relatively undisturbed forests be left the way they are. I hope that answers it. I mean, disturbed pools, yes, we can always improve disturbed pools, but I would never go in to a vernal pool in the forest and deepen it so it would hold water longer. I, I, I believe that the fact that pools dry down completely and may skip a year in a drought helps knock back invertebrate predators and diseases. So I wouldn't wanna be deepening things. What I would wanna to do to help mitigate climate change and changes in precipitation is to make sure that I had a number of vernal pools left in the landscape that had different hydro periods or amounts of time that they hold water so that you have a diversity. Great, thank you for all that. Um, Another question is, other than being local, what is the difference between this um, and the existing mitigation program managed by MNRCP? Um, MNRCP, yeah. The difference is that this is local. So a developer currently is encouraged to provide dollars to um, the state in Lufi program, the MNRCP. That money goes to the state and then people around the state can write a proposal for conserving vernal pools to use the money that was collected for vernal pools. The disadvantage of that is that not everyone has capacity to write proposals. So, you know, there aren't that many proposals coming from the county, for example. So the downside is that pools in your town, you may not as a town see those mitigation dollars and you, will, you may not get a replacement of those pools in your, your town. The other advantage the developers pointed out to us, the reason that they like the local in Luffy is that it reflects current market values. Whereas the MNRCP um, updates market values every five years or so, I'm not sure if it's five or 10 years, but the developers want their assessment done on current market value. And our program is always goes along with the current market value. The good news is that 
if a town participates in the SAMP and they hold the money and after three years they can't find a willing landowner, the town does not get penalized. That money just goes to the MNRCP. So towns don't have any risk. If they can't, if the land trust can't find a willing landowner, the money will go into the MNRCP and be available for larger vernal pool projects, but they might not even be in the county. Okay, thanks for all that clarification. Um, another question is, do male and wood, uh, do male wood frogs come to the vernal pool first and uh, followed by the females? Do they sort of arrive all together? How does that work? Yes, the, the, the males um, might even hibernate a little closer to the pool to be there first and their um, rock is calling. They sound like, well, you heard it. It's not, they sound like ducks in the pool. Um, draw the females. Great. Um, there's another question. Are there people or organizations in Maine working on salamander tunnels under the roads in highly active big night migration areas as, as has been done in other areas in the Northeast? Um, I think that Stantec has done some of that work, but I believe they've done it out of state. I know that Massachusetts has done a lot of that work. I, I saw one caller was from Massachusetts, um, but I don't know. And and I and there's mixed there's mixed um, reviews in on that. In that some of those meso predators that I showed you, like raccoons and and mm. and think and um, have keyed into those tunnels as great places to catch food. But I think that it's been successful in some places as well. So um, I think we should ask a consulting firm that. I think Stantec would have a lot more information on that. Great. Thank you. Um, what percentage of vernal pools have fairy shrimp? Who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm working with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in a, in a um, sort of a school monitoring program. There's a new fairy shrimp project that we, we have going and we're encouraging students um, to go out and monitor fairy shrimp all over the state. And we are working with a entomologist at the University of Maine as well to learn more about fairy shrimp and some caddis flies in vernal pools to get a better idea of their distribution and abundance. We have no idea and the kids are really excited about being the folks who are gonna be providing us with data. We're hoping we get enough distribution data and enough pools from the students around the state that we can get a master's student excuse me, to take on this work and fill in some of the ecological gaps that we have on fairy shrimp. Great, sounds like a worthy project. Um, a, a, uh, one of the participants says, I have a shallow pool that wood frogs lay in it almost always dries up before the tadpoles become frogs. Uh, I've considered draining or deepening, thoughts? Right, um, there's a very productive vernal pool in Orono that dries up four out of five years. And in that fifth year, when it's productive, it is a boom to the ecosystem. Um, they only need to be productive one of those five years. That's when, that's the life cycle of a wood frog. And I wouldn't, if it's a nice natural pool, I would just leave it alone. And, and also all the wood frog eggs that end up being on the pool bottom at the end of an unsuccessful year are an amazing carbon resource for the rest of the wildlife. So I, as long as you brought that up, I would not ever move amphibians from a drying pool because they you would be carrying diseases from one pool to another because those amphibians provide food for other animals. And as long as your pool is successful, you know, at some point in its life cycle within five years, it's a good pool. Great. That's super interesting perspective. So thank you for being able to provide that you know, the full life cycle uh, perspective is very helpful uh, for those of us who haven't followed amphibians around in wetsuits and so forth. Um, <laughs> it's not everybody. <laughs> it's great. Uh, not everybody, I don't think, no. <laughs> That's great. Um, anybody else have um, follow-up questions or observations uh, based on, on all of this? Feel free to unmute yourselves and, and speak up if you'd like or put them in the chat, whatever works for you. 
Heather, would you like to say something? Yes, please. Um, so I think you just answered my question, but um, I was gonna ask if there's a system in place to transfer the eggs and some of the animals from the developed areas where the vernal pools are no longer gonna happen, but it sounds like you don't wanna do that because of diseases. Well, not only that, something, um, you, you just brought up another interesting thing I should share with you because it's, it's, it's amazing. There's more and more genetic work being done on vernal pool amphibians. And a paper has just come out that has shown that urban wood frogs and rural wood frogs have a different genetic makeup. And it, what it's showing is that we call it microevolution because it's on a scale during our lifetime, right? So it's microevolution. What it's showing is that these animals are evolving with their surroundings. So an urban frog may not be as well adapted to being put in a rural pool mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, we humans think we know everything, but we don't. And some of these may be adapt, they may keep ahead of us enough that they might be all right, but the fitness is lower in the, some of the um, urban frogs, for example, their, their hopping distance is, is longer, but there are some trade backs in overall fitness um, and tra trade backs and fitness for the larvae. So it's really a bad idea, not just, I should have said this, not just for disease, but because you're, you're mixing up, um, you're missing up specific adaptive genetics. Wow. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. That was interesting. Um, Robin, did you have something you'd like to ask? Yes, um, I was very interested in the policy aspect and I'm wondering about the awareness of the municipalities in Maine and the land trusts. And I don't know if they're 90 or so in the state. Um, has your document, the turning contention into collaboration and the website been shared with the land trusts that would be motivated to work with the municipalities or the, are the municipalities aware of this that they could work with developers and, and land trusts? Yeah, we, we've been working with the Maine Municipal Association and they're advertising us, um, thankfully. And I give talks at as many land trusts on, on the SAMP who will ask. And uh, we are engaged with, um, what we're trying to do is get a really successful project launched in Topsom mm -hmm. and Orno so that we can lead by example. But I've been working with the towns in Mount A to the C. Um, I'm just me and one other colleague. So, you know, I'll only take on as many towns as I can. But what we've, we've tried to do is the, the webpage um, gives everybody training wheels um, so that all the documents and templates for adopting a SAMP and applying for it are all there. Everything is a legal template that we've used in the other towns. Uh, but yes, I, I give talks to land trusts and folks all the time and I'm available to any municipality and we're reaching out to mostly those municipalities that I showed you in the map of citizen science programs because they already have a baseline of vernal pools and they already know about me and it's just easier to work with folks who want you than folks who don't. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're, we're, we're lucky and we want you. So this is great. <laughs> um, and another question is, do some vernal pools, ephemeral pools refill in the fall and act as breeding grounds for other salamanders such as marbled salamanders? <laughs> they would if we had marbled salamanders in Maine. Oh. Yes, in New England, absolutely. They're critical for marbled salamanders. Unfortunately, we don't have marbleds here yet. Okay, great. Other, other, other questions, feel free to, to unmute yourself if you have uh, additional comments here. <laughs> oh, I was, I was just gonna mention before when you were talking about the different genetics in urban and forest pools, there's something similar going on in upstate New York, um, the Adirondacks, where they've been trying to restock brook trout or something in and lakes or ponds or whatever that are no longer acid rain, you know, dead. And um, they find that, you know, these are very individual 
species from mm -hmm. the place that they came from. And so they're restocking with ones from other places. And it's a big controversy too. Yeah, so I wonder if you've heard of yeah that. that's a great point. It, it, yes, and that goes across taxa, doesn't it? It's, it's an issue with mixing up populations and just assuming that they're all the same because we call them the same name. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Great. Well, I think we're almost ready to close up. Was there anything else that people wanted to bring bring up before we do wrap it up for the evening? All right. Well, thank you very, very much, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us. And we will send out the link so that you can share this with folks. Um, and if you have any other thoughts, feel free to, to uh, email myself. And if you want, I, I, if you don't find uh, Aram's uh, email, I'm, I'm happy to forward additional comments to her. So have a, a wonderful evening, folks, and um, check out our website for additional programs we'll be having in the spring and through the summer. Take Thank care, you. everyone. And Thank feel, you, free to, feel free to email me, too, if anyone has further questions. Thank Probably. you, Dr. Calhoun. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, this was great, Aaron. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everyone.